Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to finish up our talk about descriptive statistics looking at some measures of spread. Now remember where we're at. So we're thinking about summarizing quantitative or numerical distributions. Right, and we're thinking about that we're working through this acronym SOX. Shape, outlier, center, now we're at spread. The most appropriate measures of center and spread that we choose depend on the shape of the distribution and whether we have outliers or not. Right? So that's why it comes in this order. First want to look at the shape, see if we have outliers, then we can describe the center and spread. Right? We also want to describe the center first because when we think about spread or variation or variability, right, really what this is is a supplement to our measure of center, right? So we look and we see, okay, where does our data seem to be concentrated, right? That's the idea of a center. What, where's our central tendency, our typical value? And then we want to see, well, how far spread out is that? So the basic idea of variability, variation, or spread is that it's a supplement to our measure of center. So let's look at an example that kind of demonstrates that idea. Okay, so we're going to look at two histograms here that have the daily temperatures for a year in two different cities. Right, so we've got Provo, Utah over here on the left. We've got San Francisco, California over here on the right. All right now if we're looking at shape, right, this looks somewhat symmetric, maybe a little right skewed, fairly symmetric, but we have a lot more hot days here in Provo. Okay, but if we look at the center of both of these distributions, the center of this one appears to be, I don't know, call it 65 center of this one might be about 65 as well. So if you looked online or something, if you were deciding to want to move to one of these towns, and you looked online, and you looked at both of their average temperatures, both of these cities actually have very similar average temperatures. But if we take a closer look, right, we see that both of these scales, both of these x-axes are the same the values in Provo, Utah range much wider or much more spread out from the center than the values in San Francisco, right? In San Francisco, it doesn't get much colder than 46-ish degrees. It doesn't get much hotter than 90. In Utah, though, in Provo, Utah, it gets really, really cold some days and it gets really, really hot some days, All right? So they have similar centers Right, but the spread is much larger. We have much more variation or variability in Provo. That's why people like living in, in San Francisco. Right? There's not much variability. You really you wear the same clothes all year almost. Right? But in Utah, lots of variability. Okay, So that's spread visually, and that's the idea behind it, how it supplements our center. It adds a little bit more information on there. Okay, now one measure of spread that we have, rough rudimentary measure of spread that we have, is range. Right? I can estimate the range of this data, call it 20 to 105. Right? I can estimate the range of this data, call it 45 to 90. Right? My range is almost double over here. I briefly mentioned the range, but another way we can quantify spread, we've seen this before, is the interquartile range. All right, so remember that is your Q3 minus Q1. When we're thinking about the best or most appropriate, a lot of it has to do with shape, and it has to do with the presence of outliers. Right? For measures of center, when we saw skewness, we saw that the median is oftentimes more appropriate and more useful to describe center. And the word that we used for that was that the median is more robust. All right, so if we have skewness or extreme values or outliers, the IQR, the interquartile range, is a little bit better measure of spread than the range and a more robust measure. 
right? Because it's counting based. So it's not going to be affected by outliers or skews. Right? But really our most commonly used and most precise measure of spread is the standard deviation. Okay, so the idea, so standard deviation, right? What what a deviation is is how far is each observation away from the mean. The standard deviation means we're, we're trying to find the typical or the average deviation of each observation from the mean. Most distributions, most of our data should be within about two standard deviations of the mean. So let's take a quick look at the formulas and some, some notation here. Okay, so remember for most of these measures, we're going to have a population version, a parameter, and a sample version, a statistic. So the population standard deviation is denoted by the Greek letter sigma. And there's kind of a lot going on there in that formula. Now we're going to walk through this formula in a second. But our second formula here for our sample standard deviation, denoted as S, looks very similar to the first one, but we notice one big difference in the denominator. You would think here you would just divide by n, but we actually divide by n minus 1. So those are the big differences in the formulas. Let's kind of walk through this formula now in words. So remember the idea of a standard deviation. I want to find the average distance of all these observations from the mean. Okay, so the first step then is I need to find the mean. Then I find each of those distances. Remember those distances are called deviations. An average, we know, is we take everything, we add it up, we divide by how many we have. But think about what these deviations would look like. right? If I have a distribution, I have a bunch of data points, say the mean is right here, some of these points are going to have a negative distance, some of these points are going to have a positive difference. So what happens if I add up a bunch of positive and negative numbers, right, at this point, they would sum to zero. And that wouldn't really help anybody. Okay, so how do we combat that? Well, we square each of those deviations, then we sum them up, then we divide by how many we have. Now you saw in your formula, it depends on if we're looking for our population parameter or our sample statistic. We either divide by n or n minus 1. Now the n minus 1 thing isn't going to make a whole lot of sense right now, but we'll follow up on this in the future. Just keep that difference in mind. Okay, at this point in the process, we get what's called our variance. Your variance can be a useful measure in some ways. But remember, so we went and we squared things in step 3. Okay, so then to get back to our original units, after I have the variance, I take the square root of the variance. And finally, that gives me our finished product, the standard deviation. So 99% of the time when we're working with data, we're working with sample data. So let's examine our sample standard deviation formula again, keeping these steps in mind. All right? First, find the mean. Find each deviation, so each observation minus the mean. Square it, add those up, divide by n minus 1, because I'll be treating it as a sample. Then I have my variance, square root, that gives me my standard deviation. Okay, so there's a lot going on in that formula, but if you kind of break it down into the steps, it should be pretty intuitive. Okay, so let's just look again at the notation. Right, the variance is the average of the squared deviations. Our population variance we denote as sigma squared, sample variance s squared, the standard deviation, square root of the variance, denoted by sigma and s. Okay, so let's talk about a few properties. Of now, first of all, your standard deviation is never going to be negative, or your variance for that matter. Remember, we squared stuff. Right? So it could never be negative. It could be zero, though, only if every single observation in our data set were just repeated values. They were all the same. Okay? We do use all of our observations to calculate it, so it's not 
as robust. It can be affected by outliers. Right? But why do we prefer? So maybe you were thinking, well, why can't we just use the variance? Why do we want to use our standard deviation? Well, that's because S, or our standard deviation, is in the original units. Right? It, so it doesn't always make sense to report the variance because that will be in squared units. We want to put it back in the original context. All right, so keep in mind with our standard deviation, the mean is the context of the standard deviation. Right? The standard deviation is a supplement to that mean. I can't really just compare standard deviations or variances without a mean because different standard deviations mean different things to certain means. I could take two groups though that have similar means and compare their standard deviations. Okay, On that note of comparison, standard deviation does give us a good metric of how far something is from the mean. I can measure for a given observation and now this is kind of thinking of things from a, getting away from standard deviation as a measure of spread but more using it as a measure of location, okay, you can compare distributions by using, rather than original units, you can use units of standard deviation to compare things. Okay, this is what we call a z-score. So to find a z-score, you take whatever value you're interested in, subtract the mean of that distribution, and then divide by the standard deviation. So you'll have things in units of standard deviation, or sometimes called standardized units. Right, Z-scores can be useful to make comparisons right, between groups of different units or that have different natures. Right, Z-scores could be anything from negative infinity to infinity, but a Z-score of zero would mean you're right at the mean. Right? We mentioned that anything outside of two standard deviations is pretty unusual. So anything outside of plus or minus a z-score of plus or minus two, we can call unusual. Right? So if we're interpreting a z-score, a z-score of 1.5 would mean my given observation is one and a half standard deviations greater than the mean. A z-score of negative 1.5 means my observation is one and a half standard deviations less than the mean. Okay, so we'll look at some examples applying these ideas in the future. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.